called to order. We have the presence of a quorum. This meeting has been duly called and notice of the meeting has been posted for the time and manner required by law. We're going to start this evening with a moment of silence um, for a couple reasons. Uh, first, today is 9-11, as you all know. It's been 16 years um, since the tragedy on American soil, the uh, terrorist attack. So keep, please keep uh, those families who lost loved ones uh, in, your, in your thoughts and prayers. Also, today is First Responders Day. And I want to take a moment, really, to give a shout out to all of our first responders in Fort Bend ISD um, and in Fort Bend County and in all of our cities, especially um, really on the heels of Hurricane Harvey. They did an amazing job. We know firsthand here in Fort Bend ISD how much help they were. And so let's just keep them in our thoughts uh, as well. Thank you. Okay, we're going to start our workshop this evening with our information item. Um, we have only one this evening, and that's our 2016-17 Student Performance and State Accountability Update. Dr. Dupree. Yes, ma'am. We've got a pretty, we sent you some pre-reading because there's lots of information, and we know you have many questions. We'd like some dialogue about this, so we put together a brief overview presentation to kind of hit the highlights but we're in, prepared to engage in a more deep deep discussion about our academic achievement and accountability performance in the 2016-17 school year so i'll turn it over to diana Saavedra, chief academic officer to start us off all right well good evening um, madam president members of the board and dr dupree uh, as dr dupree indicated this evening we're going to be sharing with you um, an accountability update um, that highlights our student achievement and our ratings, um, primarily uh, for state, um, associated with the state accountability system. In addition, we're going to share some information uh, about the federal accountability system and target specific information about priority and focus schools. Um, then we'll transi transition, excuse me, into providing you some information about the supports that we've put in place to address any student achievement gaps. And we'll close the presentation this evening uh, by sharing with you a forecast of the accountability updates for 2018 and beyond. I want to introduce um, several of the members of the staff who will be presenting this evening. Um, Dr. Audra Udi, who's our Executive Director of Accountability and Assessment. Uh, Dr. Anthony Andelicato, our School Improvement Officer and Ms. Lisa Costin, who's our Director of Assessment and Accountability. Dr. Rodriguez and I will also share some information, as I said, about the instructional supports that we have in place to address some of the data. So I'm going to hand it off to Ms. Costin so she can uh, begin the presentation with the state accountability information. Good evening, Madam President, board members, and Dr. Dupree. To begin this evening, I'll be reviewing the various state accountability components and ratings for 2017. House Bill 22 was signed into law on June 15, 2017, and effective immediately, the Community and Student Engagement, or CASE, portion of the accountability was eliminated from the 2017 accountability process. Although the data had to be submitted to the state, it will not be used by the state for any accountability ratings this year. Accountability ratings this year are based on four performance indices. The first one being the Student Achievement Index, which provides a snapshot of performance across subjects. The second index is Student Progress, measures, which measures year-to-year -year student progress by subject and student group. Index three is closing performance gaps. It tracks advanced academic achievement of economically disadvantaged students and the lowest performing uh, uh, racial or ethnic student groups. And finally, index four is post-secondary readiness, 
which emphasizes the importance of earning a high school diploma that provides students with the foundation necessary for success in college, the workforce job training programs, or the military. It's important to note for this that for elementary and middle schools, it is based solely on the star performance when a student, when a student meets standard in two or more subject areas. Fort Bend ISD received a MET standard rating for the 2017 school, or, sorry, accountability year as a district, and 72 campuses uh, were rated, 71 of the 72 MET standard, with one campus receiving improvement required rating, which is Ridgemont Elementary. Also of note is the fact that McAuliffe Middle School was a former improvement required campus for the 2016-17 school year and earned a MET standard rating for 2017. And so this campus has exited the intervention process. Dr. Indelicato will speak next to give a brief overview of the improvement required and former improvement required processes and updates that we've received this year. Good evening, Madam President, board members, and Dr. Dupree. So as your school improvement officer, I would like to provide you an update on our two edge campuses that were both improvement required last school year. First off is Briargate Elementary. And again, they were improvement required for the 16-17 school year, and they earned a MET standard rating for the 2017 accountability. So as a former improvement required campus, Briargate has exited the intervention process we do realize, however, that the campus still has uh, significant improvements that can and, and should be made, and so we'll continue to, to provide them ongoing support uh, and monitoring as we have been. Uh, but officially, they have exited the intervention process, and so there will be no formal submissions to TEA uh, as we've been used to in the past through the TACE process. Ridgemont Elementary, however, did not meet standard in 2017, and so it is now a year three improvement required campus. So as a result, Ridgemont will follow a submission timeline very similar to last year uh, with TEA through their targeted improvement plan. And that's very similar to the TASTE plan last year. Once everyone's used to the acronym, now they change it. So we go from TASTE to now TIP, and that is, again, targeted improvement plan. And the similar progress, progress monitoring that we were used to last year is, uh, again, in place for this school year. So to further support um, Ridgemont, and begun the improvement process for the 2017-18 school year, and will continue to work on their um, targeted improvement plan, their TIP, outlining their strategic plan and their focuses. So uh, we'll be bringing forth Ridgemont's TIP, again, their targeted improvement plan, uh, to you at the October board meeting uh, for your consideration and approval. One thing I wanted to also add is uh, both the principals are here tonight, and I just wanted to thank them once again for their efforts. So we have Ms. Olson from Briargate and Ms. Houston from Ridgemont, and they both worked very hard this summer, uh, you know, hiring teachers, looking at their data, being strategic, and uh, leading uh, the staff to a very positive start of the school year, and they'll be doing that again tomorrow with uh, a start of the school year. So I just wanted to, to recognize them both. Thank you, Dr. Indelicato. Um, at this point, I would like to talk to you a little bit about the distinctions piece of the state accountability system. Campuses that receive an accountability rating of MET standard are eligible to earn distinction designations. Distinction designations are awarded for achievement in several areas and are based on performance relative to a group of campuses similar in makeup to the particular campus um, as far as type, size, grade span, and student demographics. Districts that receive a MET standard rating are also eligible for a distinction designation in post-secondary readiness. In 2017, um, the distinction designations were awarded in the following areas. Academic achievement in English language arts, mathematics, science, and social studies. Top 25% in both student progress and closing performance gaps. And then finally, post-secondary readiness. Fort Bend ISD 
received a total of 142 distinction designations. This is up from 108 that were received last year in 2015-16. Out of the 72 campuses that received accountability ratings, 43 earned one or more distinction designation, and seven of our campuses actually earned all eligible distinction designations. Those campuses are Commonwealth Elementary, Cornerstone Elementary, Fort Settlement Middle School, Garcia Middle School, Austin High School, Clements High School, and Kempner High School. The next area for us to discuss is system safeguards. System safeguards have been established to meet state accountability related intervention requirements. Performance results are disaggregated to show the performance of each student group on each of the indicators, which are performance rates, participation rates, and graduation rates, in relation to both state and federal targets for achievement. The performance state target for 2017 was 60%. And the performance federal target was 91% for all students and each subpopulation, including special education and English language learners. Fort Bend ISD met 76, meaning that we missed eight safe system safeguards. We missed six in the special education student group, one in the American Indian student group, and one in the English language learner student group. The purpose of system safeguards is is to ensure that in an aggregated district or campus report, substandard performance in one or more areas by one or more student groups is not disguised by higher performance in other areas or by other student groups. For example, there were only 31 students in the American Indian student group who took the writing star. That's in fourth and seventh grade and then English one and two EOCs. Because only 58% met the approach's grade level standard, as a district, we missed this particular system safeguard. All missed system safeguard indicators will be addressed through intervention activities in the district improvement plan and in campus improvement plans based on the system safeguards that are specific to those campuses. The next area that I'd like to show you is a little bit of um, a visual on the patterns and trends that we are seeing over years um, with our STAR data. At the district and campus level, the sole purpose for STAR data is to determine patterns and trends. The pattern in the three-year comparison of Fort Bend ISD to Region 4 and to the state indicates that for every grade level and content area, Fort Bend has consistently outperformed both the region and the state. We've provided a few areas of comparison to illustrate visually what this trend looks like. Here you can see third grade reading and math. This is the first grade level tested in the state account accountability system. Fort Bend ISD is depicted in green, the region is blue, and the state is yellow. In addition, in areas where the district trend reflects a consistent decrease in student performance over three years, the region and state trend reflects the same pattern. Here you can see 8th grade reading and math. This is the middle school exit grade level and one of the student success initiative grades. Again, Fort Bend ISD is depicted in green, the region is blue, and the state is yellow. And here you can see 9th grade English 1 and Algebra 1 EOC trends. This is the entry grade level into high school. Fort Bend ISD is again green, the region blue, and the state yellow. When the blue line is absent, it's because the region and state performed at the same rate. Note that the pattern in the data indicates that Fort Bend has consistently outperformed both the region and the state. Next, federal accountability for 2016-17. By federal statute, each, each state must identify the lowest performing Title I schools, impose required interventions, and provide federal school improvement grant funding to support campus improvement efforts. The methodology for identification has changed. The most recent list was effective from 2013 to 2017, so the same schools were on that list for those years. A transitional method was used for 2017 and based on 2016 data. A new methodology will be implemented next year. 
Priority schools are defined as the lowest 5% of Title I campuses across the state based on performance in reading and math as well as graduation rates below 60%. Campuses that did not meet state accountability for 2015-16, which were improvement required rated schools, were included first. The two priority schools identified in Fort Bend ISD are Briargate Elementary and Ridgemont Ele Elementary based on their 2016 IR status. Focus schools are defined as 10% of Title I campuses across the state that are the next lowest achieving and include any remaining campuses that qualify under the priority school definition, as well as campuses that meet state accountability but missed the greatest percentage of federal system safeguards when ranked with um, against one another. Identified focus schools in Fort Bend ISD are EA Jones Elementary, Mission Bend Elementary, Missouri City Middle School, and Willow Ridge High School. Um, and now I would like to turn it over to Dr. Uh, Ms. Yeah. Saivet Vedra <laughs> um, to update us on instructional supports. So um, as Lisa indicated, she shared several pieces of data with you. And as a district, um, we really uh, have built a lot of foundations to uh, address the student achievement gaps uh, that we see in our data, um, noting that as we present some of the curriculum um, development pieces, the staffing allocations, and the instructional supports that we're not simply basing our planning on uh, state accountability data, but we're looking at a number of different data sets um, to, uh, to develop our plans. Primarily, um, as, as we've been working over the course of the school year and as we will continue to work over the course of this school year, we are developing a curriculum that really addresses the needs of all of our students. Um, so as we look at our curriculum unit maps, we've got um, interventions and supports to address our special education students, our English language learners, um, our high achieving students, um, and all of the students in between. Um, and so our, our curriculum is robust with tools for teachers um, to be able to really address those needs. In addition to that, we've got, um, as you noted in our system safeguards, there's a number of different campuses who miss system safeguards associated with writing. So every unit map includes uh, an integrated section where we've got literacy integration for reading and writing across all content areas. Um, we'll be focused on a lot of professional learning with our teachers as we look to implement our curriculum so that not necessarily just in English and in uh, language arts, but in science, social studies, and math, there are opportunities for students to read and uh, to create written responses. Um, in addition, as I said, staffing allocations. We think about staffing allocations. We went through great efforts um, with Title I. Um, to look at the staffing allocations and really streamline staffing so that we could address particular needs on all of our campuses. Um, with that staffing allocation, we included um, instructional co coaches in both math and um, literacy. Uh, and for all campuses at the elementary level, we've got math, a full unit of math specialists um, that can provide instructional coaching and intervention supports for students in math at the elementary level. Uh, all campuses uh, were equipped with teacher leaders, professional learning leads, and our technology integration champions. Those teachers um, are stipended positions and will work again to build capacity on the campuses in those two areas, um, which will address um, several of our student needs. We also allocated additional staff for special education associated with co-teach and our evaluation staff so that we could target identifying uh, the student needs and intervening early with special education should they be identified. And again, with co-teach, um, increase student um, our teacher units so that we could address um, the co-teach model. There are also additional tools in the curriculum that will serve to um, help our special education students, specifically our universal screener, which is diagnostic diagnostic in nature that will help all of our students, but in particular will provide um, information 
uh, to, to our special education teachers along with our learning progressions in the, the curriculum to develop more targeted IEPs and to help us progress monitor how um, students are achieving and progressing with uh, achieving those IEP goals. Um, instructional supports include our campus support team walkthroughs. Um, we've done many walkthroughs in the past um, in the teaching and learning department, but we're taking a different approach this year. Um, we're including all, uh, we're, we're creating 11 different uh, campus support teams with uh, members of um, staff from all of the different instructional div divisions. They'll be visiting with campuses uh, once, so every campus will be visited by their team once a month. And it's really to collaborate with the principal and provide targeted support rather than principals having to reach out and request support. We're going to be proactive with the, with the support that principals are asking for and principals need. Um, as I said before, um, we've got a number of teacher leaders in place and so we'll continue with professional learning so that we can equip those teacher leaders and build capacity for the implementation of the curriculum. And um, as you will hear next week in our assessment framework update, there's a number of different shifts that we're looking at in terms of learning assessments so that again we can progress monitor where our students are um, along the learning continuum and we can intervene in real time um, and begin those interventions early on. Um, I don't know if Dr. Rodriguez wanted to include any additional information on things that are be done, being done at the school level to prioritize campuses and the needed support. Yeah, uh, one of the things that we did different uh, for this year is just uh, the overall structure for the Department of School Leadership is different. Um, in the years past, um, assistant superintendents, they would supervise elementary, middle, and high schools. This year, the structure is different. So we are specializing and we have a set group of assistant superintendents that will be overseeing the elementary level and we have a set that's going to be overseeing the secondary level. And of course we have Dr. Indelicado who's going to be specializing as the school improvement officer. So that structure in itself lends itself to uh, allow us to have better conversations. Our focus is going to be more on the critical success factors. Uh, there are seven uh, that nationally have been recognized to help schools. And you will find that it's increasing learning time, it's uh, focus on staffing, parental involvement, uh, things of that nature. So with our structure, when we meet with principals, we're going to have opportunities to really have vertical conversations and really dive deep into what does it really mean to uh, impact learning time? What, what does that look like at the different campuses? What does it look like when you have a strong parental involvement plan? What does that look like? So the vertical structure is going to allow for that. Uh, going back to what uh, Mrs. Saavedra stated earlier, the walkthroughs that we're going to be conducting as a district, that's going to assist us as a DSL to really work more with our leadership, campus leadership. So in the past, we have uh, been heavily involved with, with the walkthroughs as a Department of School Leadership. So now we're still going to be involved, but it's going to free up some of the time so we can actually work with our leaders of the campus really coach principals, which we feel can have a dramatic impact on our schools. So that's a little of, of what we're going to be doing differently as a, as a Department of School Leadership to have a strong impact uh, on some of our schools as well. Um, I'll close this particular section by saying that um, Dr. Rodriguez and I also are collaborating very closely in terms of the learning needs of principals at the leadership level as well. So we've got um, principal town hall meetings where there will be a number of different um, instructional topics um, associated with developing leadership as well as a focus on learning meeting where we're working directly with principals on how to dive into the curriculum, how to monitor curriculum implementation, and really what are some of the look fors um, in terms of, of what you should be seeing on your campus um, in the classroom. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Udi so she can close us out uh, and give us a forecast of the 2018 accountability update. turn on my mic first. Um, I would like to overview for you what we can anticipate happening um, from here on out. Um, this is much like playing a game of baseball while you're waiting on the rules uh, to come down uh, from TEA in that 
Uh, we will be working all year long to, to ensure good, solid instruction, but we won't know the official accountability rules until we're into testing season. That's just how the process works currently. Um, there are advisory committees uh, at the state level that inform the commissioner and that help him be able to make final decisions for accountability. Usually, usually those roll around about February, maybe early March. Um, so we would like to describe for you what we do know is coming from House Bill 22. That was recently approved by the legislature to impact accountability immediately. And it gives a great deal of discretion to the commissioner to work out the details of the new accountability system, both what measures will be in place and what interventions will be required uh, based on the accountability. Basically, we can summarize it in six uh, different areas, um, as shown on the middle of the screen here. Um, instead of having four indices, we will have three domains. Um, and you will notice the three domains on the far right of the screen uh, sound very familiar. Um, they are much like index one, two, and three. What you see missing from that is index four, post-secondary readiness. Now that does not mean post-secondary readiness is going away. What we anticipate will be happening with those thro uh, three domains is that post-secondary readiness will be tucked into them instead of being a separate domain. So the three domains will be student achievement, school progress, and closing uh, the gaps uh, between our student performance populations. Um, what we do know also based on the new legislation is that our district will be rated on the A to F system in each of these three domains, and we will receive an overall A to F uh, rating for the school district. What was pushed back uh, some, and we anticipate will come back in the future, is that campuses would re receive A to F ratings. Um, there's a lot of detail to be worked out there, and that's up to the commissioner to work out how that system will look uh, in the future for campuses. What campuses will continue to receive at this time is either a MET standard or an improvement required rating. Um, and then in addition to that, um, there is a provision within HB 22 to allow us to develop a local accountability plan uh, that will be optional. And at least 50% of the MET standard or improvement required type of rating must still, or A to F must still be a part of the campus ratings when that comes about. And we do not yet know details from TEA about how a local accountability plan will be submitted and what kind of details it will be, requ will be required of us. However, we anticipate some information will be forthcoming from the commissioner in that regard as well. I've already mentioned the district letter grades is one of the major components of change. Um, in addition to that, the state eliminated the case accountability ratings. Essentially what we have been doing is rating ourselves in nine content areas such as fine arts, gifted and talented, parent involvement, our technology integration, things of that nature over the last several years, and then submitting those at the end of the year in our PEAM submission to TEA. And therefore it gets posted on the TEA website and we have to post it on our local district website and share that information out. Now, the state has eliminated that as a part of the account official accountability system. However, um, there are some cri there's some critical work that's been done there over the past year with the work groups that have met and discussed priorities for the district. So what we anticipate will happen is that we'll go back to those work groups and have some further discussion about how these priorities that have been set within the committees fit with profile of, the gra of a graduate, the board's goals and priorities, and decide how to weave those into the current pieces that we have in terms of the district strategic plan, the district improvement plan, and our campus improvement plans. So there's some further work to be um, discussed and, and accomplished there in regards to the use of the case information. I will tell you we also have an alternative accountability system called PBMAS where our special programs are rated on risk levels and a lot of what we do in case pertains to those PBMAS areas as well. So it's important that we continue to talk about that work and figure out how to best use it. And then finally, public education grant or PEG campuses. Um, there are some changes coming down the pike in regards to PEG campuses as well. Um, we anticipate starting with the year 2019-2020 um, that there will be changes to how um, the state determines who is a PEG campus. In the past, if any time in the past three years a campus uh, received a poor rating or had performance groups below 50%, that caused them to be on the PEG list. The new HB 22 has stricken that language from how PEG campuses are determined, so the state is going to need to develop new language to decide who are these PEG campuses, and it, we anticipate that that's going to be uh, 
in part contingent on how they're doing in the overall new accountability system as well. Um, at this time, we would like to entertain any questions that you may have about the accountability for 2017 or upcoming accountability. And so we're open to your questions at this time. Thank you. And thanks to the entire team for all of your hard work on this and for presenting that way. I think it was good for, uh, for us to hear from each of you and from your respective departments. So thank, thanks for that. Um, I'm going to see if any of the board members have questions or comments. We'll start with Mr. Rice. Thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> Thank you for the very nice presentation. Uh, I do have a few questions. Ridgemont is in its third year of IR. At what point will the Commission of Education decide to make changes in Fort Bend ISD if Ridgemont is not moved out of IR? Under the, and I'll let you pick up from here, but under the current accountability system, if the campus were to receive another year of IR ratings, it, that type of system would kick in. After four years then. So yes, we sir. have one more year yes, to get it out of IR. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, we had a deficit curriculum audit performed in 2012. We had some holes in our curriculum. Has has all of our curriculum, is, is there anyone who can state that we have corrected all of those deficits? Yes, sir. We've looked very closely at that audit and um, I know that we're going to be scheduling an opportunity for you all as the board to navigate through the curriculum uh, documents. But yes, we have addressed um, the gaps in our curriculum, and I know that you'll be pleased um, to see um, all of the different supports that we've put in there, as I said, uh, not necessarily just uh, in terms of the curriculum standards and the scope and sequence, but we've included um, items such as learning progressions so that our teachers can really look at when a child is progressing in their learning associated with a particular standard, here are the things that they should be seeing in terms of their, their learning pieces. We've got success criteria in there that allows teachers to communicate to students, this is what success looks like and this is what I'm looking for um, in terms of the product that you're, that you're providing me. Um, and so many of these supports and pieces um, really help us to address all learners. Um, so yes, I'm confident that all of the pieces in the, um, in the audit have been addressed in our curriculum. And you'll hear more about our assessment framework that also ties into um, that piece as well next so week. So the deficits have been addressed and you're gonna present that to the board at some point later this fall. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then I understand that you've made some improvements in, in, in our, what did you call it? Uh, and how we address and how we keep track of this information and how our schools are doing. Uh, I've forgotten exactly what you said, but in it, it's not just based solely on the STAR accountability. You've added some enhancements. I forgot what you called that. Well, we've got a universal screener um, that you all approved, uh, that the board approved this summer. And so we'll be in, uh, implementing that. And that is a data set that provides us uh, diagnostic information. And so we administer that in the areas of reading and math at the beginning of the year, at the middle of the year, and at the end of the year. And it really provides us some targeted information about how we can begin to intervene with kids, especially in the area of reading and early literacy um, early on. Um, so we don't have to wait for STAR data, and STAR data is not the only data set that we have to look at. Um, because as uh, Ms. Costin indicated uh, in our work with John Tanner, um, we, we, STAR data is really only for the purpose of looking at trends and patterns in data. Uh, but they don't give us the specific information of what are the gaps in student learning that need to be addressed. And so with the tools in the curriculum, coupled with the universal screener, we've got tools that really allow teachers, um, prime them for being able to address the needs and differentiate in their classroom. Well, that is good news. And so here's my follow-up question. When Mr. Robert Sanborn with Children at Risk publishes his list in the Houston Chronicle, 
will we be prepared to publish our list of how our schools are going uh, within a week of that time? Well, uh, I would say that we right now are prioritizing our schools and we're looking at Obviously, we have to look at state accountability data, but we're also looking at other pieces. We're looking at our climate surveys, and what are our teachers saying about their campuses. We're looking at um, retention rates uh, on campuses in, ter in terms of our, our staff, because we know that retention of staff is important in the success of a campus. Uh, we're looking at retention of leadership, and also when we have campuses with new leadership, we know that those campuses need additional supports. So there's a number of different ways that we're prioritizing the needs of our campuses that are not solely tied to state accountability ratings. So I would say yes. Okay. Well, that's good because, of course, he's relying solely on the STAR test, and he, he gives every school in Region 4 and perhaps the entire state of Texas a grade without once having set foot on the campus. Mm -hmm. So any of the other enhancements that we take into account when we're measuring student achievement and campus climate and that sort of thing, I would very much like to refute his comments in, in, in the newspaper, mm -hmm. in, in writing. Mr. Rice, would you mind if I interject on that? Just because that it, what Deanna has addressed and specifically to your question is our goal is to be able to do that sooner than later. The Visioning and Planning Committee of the Board, as you know, is working toward a strong strategic plan. And part of that, what we're working on, will also be the local accountability plan. And I think that's what you're asking about, is when we can have that grade or that rating that we've, located, that we've generated locally based on what we value in this community that will come out in tandem with that. And that is our goal. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I just have a few more questions. Ms. Costin, you, you mentioned on page 7 of your PowerPoint that this 2017 system has safeguards in it. And I want to make sure I understand what I heard you say. Uh, you, were, you were commenting that some of these uh, learner groups, uh, trying to, let me think how I want to say this. The system is designed so that high performance by some students will not mask low performance of others. And so it's going to reflect an accurate uh, status that will allow will allow you to intervene appropriately and get those kids trained up. Is, is that essentially it? Yes. Basically, the purpose of the system safeguards is to allow us to make sure that we are not leaving any particular student group behind. And at the district level, which is um, what I included here in this uh, report, I gave the example of the American Indian student group. There just so happened to only be 31 students. There have to be at least 25 in order for it to count. Um, and that's to count in accountability. But the purpose behind system safeguards is the idea that all students count. And we shouldn't have uh, a system that is able to mask and, leave, and allow us to leave any student group behind. Okay. Have you received, uh, Dr. Saavedra, have you received the PowerPoint from Mike Morath that I got in July? He gave that to us at a board meeting. Okay. I think he told us at that time that he was trying to leave the uh, student achievement benchmarks unchanged for five years. So that would be probably a first for the TEA. And so we really need to support Commissioner Morath and keep him around for at least five years to make sure that no one, uh, no one changes it. Uh, and then I, lastly, I heard you say that under the new accountability, the, the campus letter grades of A through F are going to be pushed back, and we're just going to have met standard or, or not. Is, it, is that right? For the 2017-2018 year, we anticipate campuses being rated met standard or improvement required, which is similar to what we've had before, with some expectation that there will be further development toward the A to F system through the advisory committees that the commissioner convenes and solicits feedback from. We'll see okay. how that develops. So it's pushed, it's held off a year, perhaps. Right. Maybe longer, right. maybe not. Okay. But the district is still going to get a letter grade yes, this sir. year. And, of course, our community has very high expectations of Fort Bend ISD 
as a whole, which it has viewed as an exemplary school district ever since I've lived in this community going back to 1981. So we have our work cut out for us. Yes. And lastly, I would simply like to ask our, our principals of uh, Briargate and Ridgemont if they feel that we have given them everything that they need to be successful. Of course, the students have to do their homework. But uh, apart from that, uh, have you received everything that you've asked for, that you feel that you need for, for your students to be successful? If you guys, yeah, if you guys will come up to the microphone, please. Thank you. It, you didn't know you didn't know you were going to be in the spotlight. This is me. No, I, I just want to say that the district's been very supportive. Um, anything we've asked for, I feel like um, multiple people have reached out to us, offering support. Board members, you guys have made many visits to us as well, so I feel very supported, and I feel like I can ask for anything that I need. So I just think for Briargate, it's it's going to take some time. I mean, we're working with students, and so it just takes time to close those gaps even more. We've both campuses have seen significant gains and it just takes some time to continue to build on that success okay thank you last question one more Jim <clears throat> oh I'm sorry <laughs> yes go ahead no we want to hear from both <laughs> good evening everyone I, I just wanted to uh, just answer your question uh, mr. rice uh, yes the uh, district has been very supportive uh, it's it's uh, very disheartening to know that uh, Richmond is going into uh, another year of improvement required. However, uh, we did make significant gains in, in several areas. And I'm, I'm just going to just stand here and say we're, we're not giving up. Uh, <laughs> we are very uh, fortunate that uh, we, we have a very um, active president as well as our superintendent. Uh, you know, just rallied for us to not do the TASE plan, but but have relay, which is uh, uh, just uh, learning that we are now involved in. So we will definitely be a data-driven instruction uh, school, which uh, we will monitor data very, very closely. Uh, and we do have a plan in place. And having uh, Dr. Indelicato being uh, just the improvement requi uh, required officer working so closely with us, uh, not being distracted by all the other campuses' uh, needs, we are just really set up uh, for success this year. And, and I'm, I'm very um, proud to be the principal, a, a second year at Richmond, and uh, I feel very confident that next year uh, we will not be in this situation. So thank you uh, for your support. I would also add that, um, you know, as, as um, Ms. Houston mentioned, um, Ridgemont really did see significant gains in every single uh, index. Um, and really, uh, index three was somewhat problematic, and they missed it by two uh, points. What's and so index three? I, Tell us what index three was. Index three is the closing of achievement gaps. Um, and so they missed it by two points. And I know that the Assessment and Accountability Department has been digging through the data to determine whether uh, we're, you know, we need to um, apply for, um, you know, an audit and go back and see if, if there's any um, thing that can be resolved at the state level. Uh, at this point, we don't, we're not finding anything that would warrant an appeal. Um, however, as I said, I wanted to echo, in both campuses, um, we saw significant gains, but specifically in Ridgemont, they're on the cusp, and with continued support, um, I'm confident that we can get them over the hump. So. Okay, thank you. Last question, on page eight of your PowerPoint, third grade, uh, reading and math, uh, particularly when it comes to reading this graph is telling me that statewide across the state of Texas our, our students are regressing in their abilities and not progressing. Am I reading that correctly? Um, so yes, by looking at this graph you can see that the trend is down on all three areas, the district, the state, and the region. Um, but one thing that I think it's important to understand is that the 
state accountability system is has had a changing and moving target <laughs> over the years. So um, although the, this trends down, that doesn't necessarily translate into the actual skills in literacy um, trending down. It just simply means that the scores based on changing standards um, are trending down. Okay, well that's important for us to know as trustees so we can point that out when people complain and also to Mr. Robert Sanborn with Children at Risk. I would like to point that out to him and then it's just one more reason why we need to keep Commissioner Morath for five years so it doesn't change every year. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for your indulgence. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Good questions. Ms. Helliger. Thank you all for the presentation. Um, I definitely wanted to just add just a couple comments. I think it is great to see that um, overall our that we're we're trending above the rest. But you know, the other side of it is, is that we've got some opportunities, right? And I think you know, with the schools that we listed on page eleven, um, I think the public would have really. Um, like to see some of the things that you just talked about, um, Dr. Cebeda, which is where we are making those gains. And so right now, it just, which we know better, this just looks like you know a bunch of red roses right here, which we're doing great at, from a district wise. But we've got opportunities, and so how do we show the public, you know, where we've actually made some gains, in, especially in these schools that you've listed on slide 11. As, as a board member, I get questions all the time around these schools specifically because they're either um, lower, you know, when, what's the guy's name that gives them those letters? Yeah, that guy. You know, he gives them the letters, or or they, or, we, or they can just go on on the state website and see, you know, the star testing scores and those kinds of things. And so, the, the people are confused on, you know, is my kid going to the right school? And I mean, and as most of us who are parents, you know, we want to make sure that our kid is in the right place. And so, when we look at these schools, I know we've made progress, and I think it would just help for us to show the public the progress that we made knowing that we have still opportunities to um, to grow it, it just kind of in, in my mind even maybe even break it down by demographics as well because I know we've made some significant gains there as well so that, that would just be my um, um, just two cents but I think we've done a good job from a district wide but there's opportunities and I think just tell the whole picture you need to show it because we went from showing all the where we're above 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 but then we've got 11 schools or is it 11 I can't count six, six schools six. six schools and we're not really showing the percentages and where their um, where the opportunity is there okay but thank you though I think that's a good point, Ms. Helliger, because I, you, I mean, you just made a critical statement um, about Ridgemont that they were only two points from getting out of IR. I think it's important for us to know that, but it's important for our community to know that um, because we know behind the scenes, those of us who have visited, how much work has been done there and really, really what a big deal it is that Briargate came out and that Ridgemont was so close to coming out. So I, I would agree with that. I think letting us know those details and letting the public know those details um, is really important because we do get a lot of those questions. So I just would echo my support for that. Mrs. James. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, Addie, thank you for making those comments. And I would add to that, we get similar comments also about the PEG campuses. So not just these campuses that are here, but also the PEG campuses. And I don't really know um, you know, what types of gains were made in those uh, either. So I think it would be helpful for us to um, even, I know you explained about how the standards for that is changing and all of these things are moving targets and we, I think we recognize that in the accountability system, although you're right, Mr. Rice, let's keep Mr. Morath in place and maybe the target won't move as much. Um, but parents want to do the right thing for their child and, and um, they want to know 
uh, that we care and that we're making interventions and that we're being intentional about our efforts and our um, school leadership and in our uh, instruction and our, our teaching and learning. And um, so that if we can have data and, and knowledge, that helps us to talk to these parents about what's, what's going on. Um, so just with regard, let me just clarify something. What I think I heard you say with regard to the PEG campuses is that we are using um, our updated curriculum, which includes um, a little more of a literacy emphasis. We used, back in the day, when I was teaching, it was called writing across the curriculum. Um, uh, it's up, you use some other words, but it was that same type of thing, ba basically literacy throughout the curriculum so that your children are reading and writing um, intentionally in every subject area. And then I think I also heard there was a new monitoring protocol that was going into place, um, and that would be done with some maybe extra intentionality at these um, at these these campuses, the priority campuses, the focus schools, as well as the PEG campuses, is that is that accurate? Okay, you're nodding, so I'm going to say that. I'm nod as a yes. Um, okay, and then the other, I guess, real gap that I saw, and I, I, I think you talked about it, but I'm not. I didn't quite hear maybe what the intervention was, or what the intention was. When I looked at the um, system safeguards. Um, well, let me ask you one specific question first. In the system safeguard slide, there, which is slide seven, there's talk about the American Indian Student Group. Did I understand that that was um, a missed safeguard across a range of ages, or was it uh, specific on a specific grade or a specific age? It's across the entire district. So yes, it's fourth grade, seventh grade, and then English one and English two students. So okay. yes. So it's kind of an aggregate, and it's saying that, that our American Indian student group, those children, even though they can't make a full group um, to be on a campus, on a campus, if you pull those out from across those age groups, they're a little bit behind the rest. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so that's good that we found that out, and so we can target that. And then this, the it still concerns me that we have six missed safeguards in the special education area. And maybe you could just say one more time what it was that we were particularly doing about that, I, because I recall this coming up um, in the curriculum audit. It can't it's come up in the PBMAS. Um, whatever those are called knocks on the head <laughs> and I just if you could review that one more time please yes um, I would say that um, specifically and I know that I, I talk this mantra quite a bit um, but it's because I know that it's going to make a difference and that is with um, the development of our curriculum um, we have included a number of different supports and I think that the one of the the advantages of working through this curriculum development has been that we've collaborated closely with the special education department, which hasn't been done quite that way um, in the past. And so our special education department has been involved in creating those supports in the curriculum so that our teachers have tools and understand what they need to do to differentiate. That's going to help our co-teach partners as well as any teacher who's working with special education students in their classroom. And that's not just for special education, but that's true for our English language learner groups, our GT students, our students who are um, uh, you know, high achieving in the classroom. So not necessarily just tier one instruction, but supports in the form of tier two and tier three, and then specific references for our student groups. That is gonna make a big difference because our teachers are not gonna to have to go and research, how do I differentiate in my classroom, what do I do? The tools are right there for them. Then when we articulate what learning progression looks like for a given standard, it, it, it really articulates for a teacher, this is what I should be looking for. Therefore, this is the kind of feedback I can give a learner to help them go from one place on the learning continuum to the next place on the learning continuum. That's going to be specifically important for our special education students, but it's going to benefit all of our students. 
And then um, I did mention the universal screener along with the learning progressions because that will help us develop targeted IEP goals and help us progress monitor those goals more closely. So. Okay, and then there is there a connection between those um, uh, interventions, the tier one and tier two, and the monitoring uh, protocol that we're putting in place? Is that something mm -hmm. that is? Absolutely. Okay, so we're going to be watching to make sure that those interventions are taking place when we're doing all that monitoring right. process. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, then I just want to pick up on one other thing. I think Mr. Rice mentioned it and we've talked about it before and that's the local accountability um, plan. And, you know, it, it, yes, I mean, we need to align our accountability um, with our board goals, with our profile of a graduate, that's with our vision. Um, and, uh, and we need to think about aligning our, <coughs> our our board evaluation with those things um, so that we're you know we're evaluating ourselves on what we're what the rest of the world is evaluating us on uh, to a certain degree so um, that's just I'm throwing that out there as a thing to think about uh, and then the last thing I want to say is thank you uh, Mrs. Olson and Mrs. Houston for being here tonight and thank you for your incredibly hard work um, at two of our neediest campuses with some of our neediest kids. Uh, I just want to tell you that we appreciate that and we appreciate your hard work and we recognize it. Um, and, and I know Mrs. Houston, it's pretty, probably was kind of discouraging and um, difficult for you uh, to not quite, quite make that standard uh, this time, but we have confidence in you. Uh, and we are looking forward to a great year and supporting you how we can. So as Mr. Rice said, let us know when, when there are things that you need and certainly the staff to know uh, so that we can support you. And all of that being said, we feel a great sense of urgency um, around supporting Ridgemont Elementary. This is not a joke. This is, we're gone and somebody else comes in to take over that school. Uh, that's not that's not something that we you know that's that's real. Um, that's what HISD is facing right now in several of their campuses. Okay, we're right there, uh, and and we can't say well it's just them over there down the street because it's us too. So um, so we care and we we feel a great deal of urgency around this. Okay, and. Um, we, we want to know what's going on. We were looking, we'll look forward to hearing what the plan is. We'll look forward to hearing how it's going as we go through the year um, because it's very serious to us. We should all have a sense of urgency around this situation. So thank you. Thank you, Mrs. James. And I, I'd like to echo that as well because something you said, Ms. Houston, was that you're not going to give up and you're going to keep fighting and we aren't either. Um, this board is behind you 100%. We're behind both of you 100%. Um, we took a big leap in approving EDGE, and we believe in it, and we know that there are tweaks that need to be made, but we believe in the program, we believe in you, we believe in your staff, and you are dealing with human beings and not widgets. And so we recognize that it takes time to, um, to fill those gaps, it takes time. Um, but we are under the burden of the state accountability system and so we are here to support you in any way that we can, both of you. So thank you both very much because um, you took on um, a really big project last year and you stepped out and you showed tremendous leadership and so we appreciate you for that. Um, I'd like to say as well, when I had the same concerns, of course, about the special education population, but as the parent of a daughter who has not in several years and likely will never pass the STAR test, I do want to point out that we are giving children with individual education plans standardized tests, and it's stupid. It's dumb, it's ridiculous, it's outrageous, it's not best practice, it is educationally ridiculous. And so, you know, as a mom, every year I'm infuriated by it because 
my daughter walks across the stage and gets an academic achievement award because she has teachers who are amazing and who support her and she works her rear end off and she makes really good grades and then the state gives her a test at the end of the year where she has to bubble in some responses that have absolutely nothing to do with the IEP that she's worked on all year. So it's frustrating for me. And so, um, you know, I just wanted to say that because while we absolutely have to get, have to improve in those system safeguards that we miss, um, it's frustrating for me to know that you can do all that stuff in curriculum and that's great and it is gonna help her in the classroom and it's one of the things I advocated for since I've been on the board. And we are doing amazing things and co-teach is phenomenal and it's working well and I hear from parents all the time who are so grateful for it. We can do all of that stuff and Abby's still not gonna pass that stupid test at the end of the year. So it's frustrating for me because there are students like that that no matter what we do, they're gonna to struggle to pass that test and probably never will. So I say all that to go back to the local accountability. You know, that's why we believe so strongly in it. And it's, it's you know, to refute Robert Sanborn and it's to um, get our story out there about our kids. Um, and it's, it's important because our kids and our families need to know how their children are succeeding. Um, and that, that a, a standardized test is not the measure. Um, so that is really, really important, and I know you guys are working on it, um, but until we do that, we will not be able to tell our story. So it's a criti critical next step um, to the curriculum development, and so I, I just wanted to say that. Um, I, ha I sent you guys several questions, and I know that you're gonna, um, you answered some of them tonight, so thank you for that. And I know that you're gonna submit some written responses so that the entire board has the benefit. So the only other thing um, I'm gonna ask is related to writing. Um, and that's because our PEG list, and, and I think I asked the same question last year, um, the majority of the issues we have um, are relate to writing. Um, and I know that that's the hardest thing to teach, and especially as a mother of a child with an intellectual disability, good Lord, don't send us stuff home to write, um, because it requires so much, so many things all grouped into one. So my question for you is, you know, we, we rolled out our literacy plan, and are we gonna do something around writing, or is it going to tie into that literacy plan, or what are, what are we doing? to help our kids in that area? I would say that it ties into the literacy plan. Um, and I know I keep going back to the curriculum development, but that is really a critical piece to um, all of this. And when we think about the curriculum, um, when we look at writing that's tested in fourth grade, again in seventh grade, and then English one and two EOCs, well, we can't start in fourth grade. And so when we look at our curriculum, we've articulated by the end of kindergarten, what writing proficiency should student be, students be able to, to uh, produce or, or where should they be proficient in the area of writing as a developer, developing writer? Articulating that in first grade and second grade and all the way up the continuum. Um, again, including integration pieces in every single unit map that, I mean, kids have to write to develop as writers, and they can't only write in the English language arts arena because a lot of the writing that they'll do as adults right. and as learners is going to be in the other content areas. So professional development with our teachers, but having students writing in other content areas aside from English language arts is going to be important. We're doing that through um, our development of our assessment plan. So when we think about learning assessments, as you said, we don't want to um, just administer learning assessments that require students to bubble in or, um, you know, um, an objective assessment. We need assessments that also provide students opportunities to, to, to respond with a constructed response. And then working with our teachers to calibrate and collaborating with them on how do I score this and how do we cal calibrate that score so that we are seeing the writing pieces that we, you know, as a developing writer that we need to see in our students. So all of those pieces together will help us address 
writing because you we won't be able to address writing in isolation now specifically in fourth grade there's some short-term pieces that we need to do and I think that that really is beefing up our balanced literacy model having kids read and write um, especially in fourth grade but it really is beginning in kindergarten and working through so that our as our cohorts move through and get to fourth grade they're more prepared for that assessment piece um, and, 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 and along the continuum. Yeah, well, and I appreciate that, and I'm looking very forward. I know the whole board is looking forward to going through Schoology and the curriculum that you guys have put together, and mm -hmm. it would probably be helpful for us to see some of the, mm -hmm. especially those writing pieces, since mm -hmm. that keeps cropping up for us. And mm -hmm. I know it's not, um, it's, it's not just us. Um, a lot of our students uh, in Texas and really across the nation struggle with writing. And so I know all of us, you know, the, the whole point of the profile of the graduate is that we want our kids to be academically ready, but we want them to be ready to go out into the world mm -hmm. and do whatever job it is that they, you know, that they desire to do or that, that or that really that that come across that's not something they specifically thought of while they were here right it's not planned and it's and it's it's beyond what they can imagine which is why we say that mm -hmm. so i think that that is very important that we are building all of that into our curriculum and not just targeting what the star test says we need to target mm -hmm. so i appreciate that that's built in do you have something else real quick? i just wanted to add to that because right now our writing that they're getting is from social media mm -hmm. yes you know so it's many characters 140 characters, you know, um, that, that, that's the extent of what they're doing. And so, you know, I've got a 14 year old and when I text him back in full sentences, he thinks I'm a nerd, you know, he doesn't get it right because that's their reality of it. So, and, and just wanted to add, 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 that, add that to that, but that profile of the graduate, you know, does not start ninth grade, even though we're rolling it out this year, kind of new and really focusing on our ninth graders and whatnot, but it really starts at the kindergarten level. And, you know, it's unfortunate that we don't have a testing or an assessment kind of like we do the, is it DR, um, the DR testing the, um, for, reading. for reading. You know, we need something like that when it comes to the writing as well. If we truly want to focus on developing our children in the writing because it is such a gap. And I know I've had my, my high schooler could not, he tried so hard to pass that EOC test and it was difficult for him because of the writing piece of it. And so we, when we know that, you know, it's kind of like we're shooting ourselves in the foot knowing the things that we know and we're not doing anything about it. So I do appreciate the plan um, that you all are developing to improve in that area. Thank you, Ms. Helliger. Okay, thank you to the entire team. We appreciate you. Thanks for being here this evening. Um, we are now going to convene in closed session under the Texas Open Meetings Act, uh, Chapter 551, and the sections listed in the agenda. And for the purpose of a private consultation with the board's attorney on any or all subject or matters authorized by law, we are now convening closed session. <laughs>